Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Let me start by paraphrasing the great Ronald Reagan. I'm from the who, and I'm here to help. <laughs> Those should be the most terrifying words in our English language today. So I'm going to be talking to you about the WHO, the upcoming international health regulations, um, their amendments to the existing IHR, and the proposed pandemic preparedness treaty, which is in parentheses because it's not really a treaty. Um, under the pretext of pandemic preparedness, increasingly totalitarian policies are being rolled out and our human rights will be trampled on. The new treaty and the amendments that are being negotiated now, they remove existing guarantees of human rights and freedoms during designated emergencies which they get to define what is a designated emergency. Um, and they transfer authority from managing pandemics from individual nations like ours, who during the last pandemic actually had the right um, to control our pandemic response, even though we didn't necessarily do it that way. But under these new documents, we will transfer our decision-making ability formally from the individual nations to the WHO. So I want to start by telling you a little bit about the WHO. And as over the uh, last year, I've been talking to members of Congress and others, there's a, a lot of misunderstanding where people say, this isn't as bad as you say, or can you tell me more about no, it's the- it's worse. Yeah. <laughs> you, can you tell me more about the WHO, or you don't know how it works? So I want you to know how it works, OK? It was originally started in the 1940s, and it was supposed to be organized on the principles of human rights, and under this understanding that every country should be independent, every person equal, and that human agency and autonomy are fundamental to a good society. So the WHO Charter does emphasize that thing, but we know that this is really just empty rhetoric. And the problem with this empty rhetoric is when the officials at the WHO and the World Health Assembly were forced to follow this, they realized that they actually couldn't be in control of everyone if they were acknowledging that each state, each country had the right to make their own decisions and that individuals had autonomy over their medical care. So the way that the WHO um, makes, it, makes decisions is it's led by, um, well, there's 194 countries and each country has one vote, no matter how big the country is, no matter what their GDP is, no matter if they're totalitarian or, or, or a democracy, each country gets one vote in the WHO and the leader, um, you guys probably know, is a guy named Tedros Gabresu. Uh, everyone calls him Tedros because his last name is really hard to pronounce. He right now, as the Director General of the WHO, in that position, has the power to declare a public health emergency of international concern, a PHEIC, because they love the alphabet game. Um, right now, he has the power to make temporary recommendations, such as things regarding persons, cargo, border closures, forced quarantines, mandated medical examinations, testing, and vaccination. Again, right now, they are only uh, temporary recommendations and not mandate. So anything that happened during the last pandemic that Tedros told us to do, we did not because we had to, but because we wanted to follow him as a country. Now the governing body of this is called the World Health um, Assembly, and that's made up of those 194 countries, plus two more, the Vatican and Liechtenstein, who are apparently not members of the WHO, and they are the ones who are gonna vote on the amendments to the international health regulations and the um, pandemic, not a treaty treaty. Um, so let me just go into briefly, and I am so glad that both Diana and Treasurer Oaks talked about this, um, but this is the issue of the public-private partnership and what has happened to the WHO to help it along its mission to move from one where individual countries had autonomy to where they don't. So the WHO was started and it was supposed to be to promote global health and every country contributed some money to it. Um, and that all changed in the 1930s with an organization called the Wellcome Trust 
that was led by a doctor in the UK who wanted to specifically fight malaria in Africa. So he directed, he set up a trust that directed money to the WHO for that particular purpose. Um, and that was actually like in theory not a bad thing because children were dying from malaria and in Africa, and he didn't think the WHO was doing enough on that. Then in, in 2000, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation became a major direct funder of the WHO. You can see they're the number two funder after Germany of the WHO. And this was in 2020 to 2021. So it's now 2023, we don't know. Um, they really brought in the idea of the public-private partnership into the WHO. Um, which means that, um, and, and not only did they do that, but if you see the Gavi Alliance, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, that's another Gates thing. Um, there are other, some, some other um, nonprofits or, or private things on there. What has happened is now these um, nonprofits are directing the WHO in what they can work on. The WHO only has money that is given to it. When it was given to it by nations, they had more of an authority over what they focused on. But when Bill Gates is your number two donor, he gets to call the shots on what's happening. Um, when I was speaking with some uh, recovered WHO um, employees, bureaucrats who have now left that and joined the Sovereignty Coalition and are speaking out, um, and they still obviously have some affinity for their old workplace, and they will say, the people there aren't bad, but it's who's calling the shots. They don't have any say on what they do because the Bill and Melinda Gates and others are the ones who are now calling the shots on that. We know what they did to us during COVID. I don't need to go through that. They really tried to create a world in which the public accepts information as true without question, obeys leaders who impose top-down control, and re require public obedience to government actors who are actually enriching themselves and mega corporations at the expense of our sovereignty and freedom. They withheld if, uh, effective treatments. Um, they actually went against the 2019 WHO um, recommendations. So prior to COVID, the recommendations was do not shut down, do not quarantine, do not mask people. That was their official policy. They threw that completely out the window in this pandemic. Of course, we can't talk about the pandemic um, without talking about Klaus Schwab. He said in his book, uh, COVID-19, The Great Reset, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. And then the World Economic Forum on the front page of their website claims that they will show the world how we can recover from COVID-19 to build a healthier, more equitable, and more prosperous future. And that's directly from their website. So um, let me go into what we're gonna be talking about here. This is a lot of information. There's two things. There's the draft international health regulations. They will lay out the new powers of the WHO during health emergencies and broaden the context in which they can be used. They concentrate on the specific powers and purposes sought by the WHO, and they will be voted on in May of next year. So there have, there have been amendments. Uh, this has been going on for the last two years now where this group is getting together and they're going through these amendments that are submitted by different countries and different entities. Um, but right now we're looking at a process where they, they have released the latest document, but there are still 300 amendments that we don't know what they say. Um, they will have to finalize the, um, those amendments by December or January so they can be su submitted to the World Health Assembly and they can vote on them by May. They need 50% of the members present to approve. And if they're approved, then each country has 10 months, it's reduced from 18, to reject them. If they are rejected, so say the US were, something were to happen to our current president and we got someone sane in there by May of 2024 and he decided to reject them, 
that would be great. We wouldn't be technically bound by them, but they do go into effect if 50% of the nations agree. And then we will suffer some kind of, um, anyone who disagrees will suffer some kind of penalty. So um, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, other countries can impose sanctions and punish the countries that haven't agreed to the international health regulations and aren't agreeing to go along with them. At the same time, that was not voted on by the Senate because the international health regulations are already in place. And actually in last year's national defense bill, um, the Senate inserted language that was bipartisan that said, yes, the United States agrees with the amendments to the international health regulations, even though we don't know what they are. We agree and we're going to move them forward. Um, going on at the same time is the draft CA plus, and that is the WHO Convention Agreement or Other International Instrument on Pandemic Prevention, Preparedness, and Response. This focuses on our government's response regarding bureaucracy, financing, and all those things. As you can see in the name of it, the word treaty isn't in there, and that's for a specific purpose, so that the United States and other states they say we have to ratify, but we do not have to ratify it as a treaty. It will not have to go before the Senate. This is actually gonna come through at the same time. Um, so this is um, some very dangerous stuff, and I'm going to go quickly through what some of these things are. So we're gonna focus first on the international health regulations. Again, we don't have to vote on these. We've basically already said we agree to them, um, and, but we don't know what the final version is gonna look like. Here's what we do know now. Um, the purpose of them was to improve coordination of international surveillance and response to health emergencies, particularly pandemics, to quote, prevent, protect against, control and provide a public health response to the international spread of disease and avoid unnecessary interference with international traffic and trade. Those are great things. That's how it started out in 2005. Originally, they were supposed to um, respect our sovereignty and be flexible. But these new um, amendments are dangerous. One amendment proposes to do away with the phrase, with full respect for the dignity, human rights, and fundamental freedom of persons. That's in the current international health regulations. They want to throw that out. Um, here are some of the other things you can read that they do. Dangerously, they expand the definition of pandemic and health emergencies. Now it will include the potential for harm rather than actual harm. So, and what is a pandemic? Is it a global health emergency? What is a health emergency? Is it COVID-19? Is it MPOX that they actually declared a pandemic? Um, or is it things like, I don't know, climate change, gun violence? All these things Tedros has suggested are global health pandemics. They changed the recommendations from non-binding to mandatory. Um, they direct, the director general has to declare emergencies. Um, he can now for any measure at any time for any potential risk. Again, this is global health. This is your climate, your gun violence, anything. Establishes public health bureaucracy. Sets up extensive surveillance in all states. We need to track where the violence, where the um, biologic, where the virus is spreading. So they will have, they require us to set up surveillance. Maybe that's testing our wastewater, things like that. Um, it enables them to share country data without consent. Um, gives them control over our resources, financial contributions, intellectual property, um, and know-how. It actually forces intellectual property holders to waive their exclusive patent rights. Now, we've seen with the limited liability that the pharmaceutical companies had during the last pandemic. So this idea that they're going to force the pharmaceutical companies to waive their patent rights, again, it's one of the amendments. And when I talked to the former UN guy or the former WHO guy, he said, yeah, you know why that's in there? Because when they negotiate the amendments, 
they have to have something that they negotiate out. And the pharmaceutical companies are never going to allow the final document to come out with them not having their patent rights. So that was in there so that they can do a little horse trading. So we don't expect that to survive. Um, there will be no freedom to disagree with the WHO's recommendations. And the states, that is the countries, must counter mis and disinformation. Again, this is part of both the international health regulations and the pandemic preparedness treaty, non-treaty. Um, so it, again, it changes the provisions affecting individuals from non-binding to binding. And again, that's your border crossings. That's your testing and tracing. That's your travel restrictions, your confinement, quarantine, medical examinations, and vaccine requirements. So not only does it affect us at the country level, but it will affect individuals at the individual level. In short, countries right now can assess public health events and decide what measures and policies to take. But under these new um, international health regulations, they will not be able to do that because the WHO can declare an emergency for mere potential threats to public health without individual countries giving their okay. So that's the international health regulations. Bad, bad, bad. Let's go on to the pandemic treaty. And I'm going to read here from the this, this document does not exist in legal form right now. It is just a draft. And here is what they say the objective and scope of the document is. The objective, objective of the WHO CA plus, guided by equity, the right to health and the principles and approaches set out herein is to prevent pandemics, save lives, reduce disease burden, and protect livelihoods through strengthening proactively the world's capacities for preventing, preparing for, and responding to, and the recovery of health systems from pandemics. The WHO CA Plus aims to comprehensively and effectively address systemic gaps and challenges that exist in these areas at national, regional, regional and international levels through substantially reducing the risk of pandemics increasing pandemic preparedness and response ca capacities, the progressive realization of universal health coverage, and ensuring a coordinated, collaborative, and evidence-based pandemic response, and the resilient recovery of health systems at community, national, regional, and global levels. Isn't that enough to make you scream? Phyllis would just have like, ah, you're kidding me. What a bunch of nonsense. Okay. So let's look at what they're going to do. They're going to set up an international supply network overseen by the WHO and require um, at least or more than 5% of national health budgets to be devoted to health emergencies. Again, they're going to strengthen health systems with a view to the progressive realization of universal health coverage. They're going to unite public and private sectors, relevant agencies, uh, consistent with the international health regulation and integrate all these tools into the WHO. They're going to share viruses and bacteria that have pandemic potential with the WHO and other governments. Okay, so I'm not a doctor, but I have talked to a bunch of doctors in the Sovereignty Coalition, and they are very worried about this thing. You will remember during COVID where somehow the the ge genomic sequence of the Wuhan virus was um, made available to other countries and, and to the um, pharmaceuticals. Here, if we have a virus, we're, we're basically sharing biological weapons because some of these that are being developed, and I'm not saying COVID was, you can think what you want, but these viruses and bacteria that are being developed will have to be shared around the world. or. And what that means is that honest countries will have to share them with dishonest countries, because we know the dishonest countries aren't going to share. Um, again, establish a whole, of society, a whole of society response. Again, this is the public, private, the NGOs. Um, they're going to protect vaccine manufacturers by protecting their liability, by limiting their liability 
you can't sue them again, and set up a governing body. And I want to get into one of the most dangerous things they're going to do. Um, they're going to censor, I mean, control information. Article 18 says, the party shall combat the infodemic <laughs> to tackle false, misleading, misinformation, and disinformation. Then they define infodemic means, and this is their words, not mine, too much information, including false or misleading information in digital and physical environments during a disease outbreak. It causes confusion and risk-taking behaviors that can harm health. It also um, leads to mistrust in health authorities, well, they're right there, and undermines the public health response. So all the countries that sign on to this will have to fight the infodemic, which means giving us too much information. And finally, from the obje objectives of their document, the WHO CA Plus applies at all times, including during and in between pandemics. So what can we do to stop this? Number one, we have to uh, defund the World Health Organization in our government funding bills, our appropriations bills. Just earlier this week on Thursday, when so many of you were on the Hill, um, the House passed the Foreign Operations Spending Bill. That bill does zero out funding for the WHO. Of course, I, that's, that's wonderful. So the House has made a definitive statement, no money to the WHO during this next calendar year. Of course, we're right now I'm getting texts about the continuing resolution and some kind of omnibus. We need to contact our members of Congress and insist that any final spending bill that goes through this year includes no funding for the WHO. President Trump did pull the US out of the World Health Organization. It is not a, you, a president can't just do that. He sends notice that he's gonna do that and then it takes a year for that notice to come into fruition. In that year after he sent notice, Biden was elected, Biden put us back in. So we are back in, um, but we need to m make sure that no funding goes to the WHO this year. Andy Biggs, our great friend from Arizona, um, has HR 79, and that actually removes us from the WHO and prevents any money from going to it. That bill currently has 51 sponsors. It doesn't have enough, and it doesn't have a sponsor in the Senate. So we need to push that. That's a little bit of a longer process. Um, Senator Ron Johnson from Wisconsin, our great hero on, on COVID, has a bill, S444, the No Who Pandemic Preparedness Treaty Without Senate Approval Act. It already has 47 co-sponsors, all of whom are GOP. Now, during the, um, there was a vote earlier this year on removing some authorization or getting us out of Iraq, Iran or Iraq. I can't remember what, the bill had nothing to do with the WHO. Senator Johnson offered this bill as an amendment to the bill and um, it had all the Republicans voting for it and none of the Democrats, and it did not pass. And what it says is this WHO CA plus treaty, non-treaty because they don't use the right word, must come to the Senate for a vote. That's all Ron Johnson's bill does. Doesn't get us out of the WHO. It says if we're gonna have this so-called treaty, the US has to ratify it. And Every single Democrat member of the United States Senate said, no, we don't have to. We can agree to all this stuff that isn't even finalized yet, and we will do it without Senate ratification. Um, so we need to work on the Democrats as well. And finally, we need to spread the word on um, the Sovereignty Coalition. I've put the website up there. Um, that's the organization that Frank Gaffney helped to start, that we joined, and I'm proud to say that we are the only pro-family group that is a member of this, and they really count on us to get it, the word out to um, the grassroots. Now, there's some 
other groups that are in there. There's a great group um, of vaccine injured people who are in there um, who have some great grassroots members. But we are the lone pro family group that is in that coalition. Um, and we really need to get the word out. Um, there are some great websites, the Brownstone Institute. Um, there's a guy by the name of David Bell, who's the one I've talked to extensively. He knows this stuff inside and out. And he has written. Uh, a number of articles on there that you can forward um, to your group meetings, have a group meeting and read it and discuss it. They're not that long. Door to Freedom is another one that has short two to three minute videos as well as longer videos where they go through each issue. Uh, I also put up the WHO website and the UN website as well. Um, this information will be available on the Eagle Forum website and the Council website, so you will have it. Uh, you don't need to write down any of those websites right now. You can just go back on our Eagle Forum uh, Council page, and it's all there. One last thing, the thing that um, Frank Gaffney talked about last night, last week, September 20th, at the UN meeting, uh, the UN General Assembly president agreed to a declaration in support of the pandemic treaty and the international health regulations. Now, this declaration is supposed to be this really big deal where everybody's going to agree, yay, go forward, finish these documents. We all love what you're doing. Put in all this censorship stuff and put in all this control for the UN and the WHO. We're all for it. So they, because of COVID, they're still operating under COVID rules, and they have something called the silence procedure, where they put this document up, this declaration, and if nobody objects, it's deemed to be agreed to by every nation. So we were on a call, what can we do to get countries to object? What can we do to get countries to object? And we were thinking, does anybody have any contacts with any countries that might want to object? We said, no, nah, nobody really does. We found out that 11 countries, and I don't have the list in front of me, some of them are not our friends, objected. Now, a lot of these are countries with not a lot of money, and the reason they objected is because these documents don't have enough money being transferred from first world nations to third world nations. So um, that's why they objected, but they objected anyway. So it was not a universal declaration. Yay, right? Well, now, do you think the UN is going to let that word out to the American people and the world? No, no, no. So what they did is they said that the UN General Assembly president agreed to this declaration on behalf of everybody else. But if you are, if you hear that the UN agreed to it, they did not. They did not follow their procedures. They just had the president come out and say, on behalf of everybody else, I'm accepting this Academy Award on behalf of everyone else, and I, I want to say how happy everyone is that I have it. Um, now, it really doesn't have any effect because we know these UN busybodies all are in support of this stuff, um, so it doesn't make any difference in the long run. It was just a yay, clap, we all love what you're doing over there, keep up the good work stuff. So let me close by saying this. We know that COVID stands out from the previous pandemics because of the WHO and the global public health, the way that they acted. Despite the rarity of pandemics, they're acting like these are going to happen all the time and that they need these new documents and these new powers to counter any future pandemic. There have only been three in the last 100 years and they've all been in the last 20 years. So. Um, we also know about the dangers of the public-private partnerships, um, and they're only getting bigger with the Gates Foundation, the WEF, and other powerful forces. And we know that the, U Look, the World Health Organization is not alone, okay? UNICEF used to be focused on uh, promoting children's health. Now they focus on max mass vaccinations. Um, the World Bank has developed the Financial Intermediary Fund to support pandemic preparedness and response and to fund the development of surveillance identifi and identification networks around the world. They're also backing what was backed at the G20 Summit, which is the digital passports and IDs. 
Let me just close by saying, how can we take seriously claims by the same official, officials who mishandled the COVID-19 that they are acting to spare us hmm. from any future medical or economic disaster? How are they going to do that? By employing the same strategies they used in the past, but this time on steroids. No government or health officials have admitted their mistakes in the past. And that should convince us to never let them do this again. Why are we going to let them draw up this new treaty and make these new international health amendments when they have failed so disastrously in the past? We must fight back. We need your help. I am happy to speak to any group that you have. Um, I am happy to get people to your groups to speak on this. This is something that is going to take grassroots mobilization to fight back. But we can do it, um, and we can make a difference. So thank you very much for letting me talk about this really heady topic. And I look forward to working with all of you on this in the future. Thank you.